Hey everyone, it's Ryan with Spiceworks. Thanks so much for hanging out with us today. We have another Spiceworks partner webinar, Is Privacy Dead? Brought to you by Spectresoft. A few things I hope everybody checks out. The first is the question box on your screen. Please don't be shy, ask questions. I know our presenter would absolutely love to field them. We're going to get to the Q&A at the end of the presentation, so hold tight. And another thing is that we are recording the webinar, so if you have to step out for any reason, it's no big cause for concern. You'll get a link to that recording in about a week. And uh, finally, and this is just great, Spectrosoft has been kind enough to provide a prize to one lucky attendee. It's a GoPro Hero 3 Plus. Uh, we're going to announce that winner at the end, uh, and you have to stay on the line to be eligible, so hang out with us. And finally, I'm going to turn it over to the star of the show. We have Mike Tierney, and he is a COO for Spectrosoft. And he's also going to be joined uh, by his colleague, Ezra Charm, Director of Marketing Operations at, Spe excuse me, at Spectrosoft. Guys, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Ryan, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that's ever the first time and probably the last I've ever been called the star of the show, so I appreciate it. Um, thanks to everybody for, for taking some time out of your busy days today to, to spend a little bit of time with us here today. Um, you know, it's always, it's always my goal when I do these, and our, and our goal as a company is to, is to try to be informative and, uh, and pass along some interesting information, and I think the topic that, uh, that we're talking about today couldn't be any more timely. You know, the title of the webinar, Is Privacy Dead? You know, somewhat provocative question, but it's something you can't, uh, you can't look anywhere in the news right now without some discussion around this. Um, there's a lot going on in Europe right now, specific to Google, and we'll touch on that a little bit. Um, you know, and there's certainly some residual uh, still discussions going on from some things that have happened in the news of late. Um, you know, there's actually even a very interesting article that came out today I saw it on the website politico.com. Uh, it's by a couple of folks, Josh Gerstein and Stephanie, Stephanie Simon. And I would, I would encourage everybody to go read it because it's a pretty interesting read. And um, while I normally like to be prepared well in advance for a webinar, I'm going to try to pull some things out of their article today because it was right on topic. And that, that tells me that we're probably talking about something of interest if, if people are writing uh, big articles on the same topic. So with that said, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about privacy in a in kind of a broader sense, because there is so much discussion and interest around it, um, and then we'll we'll kind of move that into the workplace as we go. So, um, you know, without any further ado, you know, kind of start off with a statement. And before you accuse me of going completely Captain Obvious on you, um, you know, I, I think we do live, you know, obviously in a society, but I think we need to come to grips with the facts that we live in a surveillance society. Um, and, and that there is very wide-ranging and broad surveillance going on all the time. Um, and some of the things that my company does uh, do fall into kind of an employee surveillance uh, bucket. Um, but, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about what is going on around us and, and kind of the society in which we live today. Um, so, you know, as a, as a starting point, and hopefully the animation is working on this. I built it myself, so I can't blame anybody if it doesn't. But if you think about just your commute to work this morning, um, unless you're luckier than me and you get to bike to work or something, um, you probably posed for a lot of pictures, um, whether you knew you were doing it or not, um, because there's a lot of cameras out there. You know, there's a toll plaza by my house where the, every time I go through it on the way to and from work, they take a picture of me. Um, you know, I found some interesting data. Uh, I actually looked to Gartner for this, and uh, they're projecting that by 2020, in the world's top 50 major cities, 70% of individuals, you and me, physical activities outside of our residence will be monitored. Um, and by that same year, 2020, the average individual will be recorded on at least 200 cameras per day in the world's top 100 cities. So that's, uh, that's pretty sobering if you think about it, that you can't really, uh, you know, th there's no time for a, for a private moment if you're out in public, I guess is the takeaway from that. And so then I started to think about that a little bit and started to think about whether that was bad. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of legitimate debate over, you know, Edward Snowden and what he did, you know, the traitor versus hero debate. But I think there's even more legitimate debate about what he called attention to, which is this ever-increasing government data collection and surveillance. Um, you know, but then on the side of the, on the second side of the slide there, on the right-hand side, you know, there's kind of what I think is somewhat of a compelling argument um, that there are benefits to this. And, you know, if you, if you recall the, the tragedy in Boston, um, you know, part of the reason, I think a big part of the reason that we were able to zero in on those guys and prevent them from doing anything else 
was the presence of all these cameras, and they were able to isolate on them quickly, identify them, and then go find them. So, you know, there's a lot of pros and cons to this, and I think that's why this is going to be a debate that's going to go on for, for quite some time. Uh, but the fact is, we are being surveilled all the time, and we leave, you know, fingerprints and footprints everywhere we go, and those fingerprints and footprints create a picture of us and how we behave, um, whether it's, you know, physical through, through things like license plate tracking um, or things that we're choosing to do online. You know, and, and, and back to Gartner for just a minute, um, you know, they're saying that by 2017, so right around the corner, 95% of activities online will be gathered, analyzed, and stored. And the market for individual profiling, data gathering, and then the selling of that um, will top $10 billion. Um, so we're, we're talking about big business um, that is consuming all of this data in addition to the government. And I think, you know, that, that brings a whole other set of challenges. You know, in that political article, uh, Politico article that I referenced earlier, you know, some, some really interesting observations. Um, you know, if you have a smart meter attached to your house from the power company, they pretty much know whether you have a plasma TV and what time you're cooking dinner. Um, you know, and, and when you start to think about the types of data and the, and the way people are able to model your life, um, you know, it, it, it's sobering for sure. Um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about privacy and, and efforts made potentially to, to improve consumer privacy, um, but technology changes so quickly that it's almost impossible um, for a government to keep up. And, you know, as an example of that, and I'm, and I'm citing the same article here, you know, back in uh, 2012, the, the current administration proposed a consumer privacy bill of rights. Um, now we're in 2014, and what they were talking about then is hopelessly outdated. Um, you know, right now, there are companies that are on license plate readers that drive around mall parking lots, and they're just scanning your license plate and uploading that and making that data for sale. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of very rapidly evolving technologies. And I think, you know, over history, we've seen that, you know, governmental um, control doesn't really do a good job of keeping up with technology. And then we have the flip side of that, that I think there's a lot of conflict on that, on that level because you also have a government that's embracing data collection. Um, and while we can, we can admire the administration for putting out, you know, and starting a discussion on a consumer privacy bill of rights, the same administration's campaign was famous for its aggressive data mining. Um, you know, and, and getting into big data to help it identify v voters and motivate voters and sway them. So you can see the conflict kind of isolated there. Um, there's, there's a siren song to the power of this big data that can be collected. It's very hard for people to resist. And the flip side of that, um, you know, is, is the urge to resist it or the, the necessity to re resist it. And if you're talking about the government and responding to people's needs and wants, you know, we sort of have to demonstrate those to folks. So there was a national survey by Pew Research um, pretty recently that said two-thirds of Internet users thought current laws weren't adequate to protect consumer privacy online. Um, and that's a pretty big, compelling number, and you would think that someone would respond to that. You know, in the title of the, the uh, presentation, we asked a question, you know, and, and I think I'm comfortable in saying that the answer to that is yes, privacy is dead. You know, what just scrolled past you on the screen there at a pace that was entirely too quick for you to read, unless you're a much better reader than I am, was an excerpt from the, a Google privacy statement. Um, and it's absolutely an interesting read, and if you haven't read it, I encourage you to do so. Um, there's also a lot of interesting news over the last couple of days stemming out of Europe and changes that Google may need to make um, in how they respond to privacy requests in Europe. Um, and, I, and I'm not picking on them that, you know, they happen to be an 800-pound gorilla, and the 800-pound gorilla always gets a lot of attention. But, you know, think about that privacy statement, the excerpt from one that just scrolled past. Um, I played it at a fast speed on purpose because I think it, it sort of illustrates the challenge. We, we think two-thirds of us think, well, there's not sufficient protections on the Internet for our privacy. There are things we can do. There are steps we can take um, to enhance our privacy or not deal with services that lever our personal information in ways we might not want them to. Um, but 
in general, I don't think we're willing to do it. Um, so if you think about the median length of a privacy policy is about 2,500 words. So that's going to take the average person about 10 minutes to read. Um, the number of domains, um, you know, the average person visits per month is about 100. So if you do the math, you know, ask yourself the question, you have almost 17 hours a month to do nothing but read privacy policies and change your behavior based on what those things say. Because that is a step that we could take. But what we're willing to do is trade, um, you know, kind of convenience and expediency for, um, you know, the benefits and the value or the enjoyment that we get from these online services. You know, if I go back to the, uh, the article that I mentioned um, earlier, you know, there's a quote from, from Senator Jay Rockefeller, and uh, he's talking about the Internet, and he said, once we decided we're going with the Internet, we gave up our privacy. It's a double-sided thing. It's the greatest discovery ever made, and it's one of the worst things that ever happened. And I, and I thought that that was a very interesting perspective on what we're dealing with, and I thought about, um, you know, all the websites that I go to. I tell you, I, I don't read these privacy policies, and I don't think most of you do either. And there are some out there that really bear reading. Um, and, you know, depending on the information you're putting up there, they can learn a whole lot about you. Um, and then they're going to make that data for sale, um, I would say, almost 100% of the time. But in general, um, and I think most people would agree with me, we've willingly become data points. Again, we've traded um, privacy for expediency. Um, you know, privacy for some other benefit we might really like to play. Um, I, my wife is always playing something on Facebook or posting something on Facebook, and you know, so she's made a decision to trade some privacy for that, and that's uh, actually a topic of discussion in my house. Um, all this information, you know, is used about us, um, and if we stay in the commercial realm, for profit. Um, and you know, this data that we collect has a lot of commercial uses. There are other uses for sure, some of the governmental things we've talked about. You know, this was an infographic that I found online that I thought did a pretty good job of representing how uh, companies that are looking at your online behavior um, see you and see us. Um, so, they're, you know, they're able to see aggregated data. They're also able to see very individualized data. Um, you know, there's a company out there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spell the name. I think it's pronounced Axiom. It's A-C-X-I-O-M. Uh, they're a data collection firm, a data broker. Um, and they, uh, they, they launched a website uh, that lets consumers, would let you or I go on and see the data that they have on us. And so that seems like a noble effort. Um, since they did that, about 250,000 people have logged in to look at their data. Um, I guess that seems like a big number, but in the scheme of how many people are online, that's not really a big number. Of those 250,000, only 2% have said, yeah, I want my file taken down. Um, and about 20% took the time to, to make corrections to the file, which, um, you know, to the company suggests that they like the information being available to marketers because you're, you're going out of, the, out of your way to make sure it's effort uh, or make sure it's accurate. Um, you know, again, I'm pulling that from the Politico article, but, you know, that one struck me today is that something that, you know, two-thirds of the people say, well, there's not adequate protections for us online, but given the opportunity to police it ourselves, if we're concerned about it, that... I guess it's not worth the time. Um, so I, I found that very interesting. So what I wanted to do now, I hope to, to sort of set a tone for, for in general, what's going on um, with, our, with our privacy and the trade-offs that we're making. Um, I thought I'd transition now to talk a little bit about uh, expectations, the expectation of privacy, and then a, a really important word around that, you know, the reasonable expectation of privacy. And, and as we do that, we'll start to transition to into um, you know kind of privacy in the workplace, and that obviously dovetails into the company that I work for and some of the topics that we deal with on a regular basis. So, um, so let's talk about expectations a little bit. And there's a fundamental difference. I mentioned Europe a little bit earlier between um, the European approach to privacy and the United States approach. And uh, I apologize to anybody joining us from countries that aren't in those two areas. Um, but those were the two that I thought have the, the biggest contrast and were interesting to look at. So in the U.S., you know, privacy is protected um, when there's an actual and reasonable expectation that privacy exists. Um, so if somebody reasonably can say, no, I thought that was private, 
then they can get legal protections on that. And again, that reasonable word is going to be very important. In Europe, they start um, without that condition. It's not conditioned on an expectation of privacy at all, um, which, which makes the, uh, the barrier to, um, oh, for lack of a better word, intrude on someone's privacy much, much higher. Um, now, for the, for the rest of this uh, webinar, I'm going to stay in the United States because it's where I live and where I believe most of, uh, most of you folks are from. So I'm not going to try to bounce back too much. Um, quite honestly, it can start to make your head hurt because there are some you know, very diametrically opposed viewpoints. But I think you know, for, the, for the bulk of the audience, we'll stay in the United States and, and, let, and let's talk a little bit about you know, the, the three main sources of privacy protection in the U.S. Um, and this, you know, this I think gets pretty interesting. We're going to stay on this slide for a little bit, and unfortunately, you're going to need to hear me talk for quite a while. Um, you know, the first is the Constitution, um, and I think you know we're all educated here, and we're aware of the Fourth Amendment and the privacy rights that are in the Constitution. Um, if we talk about privacy in the workplace a little bit, then the Constitution does uh, provide some privacy protections for public employees. So, if you're a government employee. Um, you know, there are constitutional protections on your privacy. Um, you don't lose your Fourth Amendment rights just because you went to work for the government instead of, you know, Walmart. Um, you know, if, if there are instances, however, that your employer, the government in that case, can go in and, and look at your activity or the things that you're doing without a warrant, which is what everybody always goes to with the government, um, they can do that in circumstances and not be in violation of the Fourth Amendment. Uh, there's a case, if any of you guys are into reading case law, um, Ontario v. Kwan. Uh, you can go out and Google that and read it. That's a really good case that kind of illustrates what I'm talking about. Um, but basically, you know, as that worked its way up, the Supreme Court um, you know, indicated that it believes public employers have to be given wide latitude to conduct work-related um, non-investigatory searches as well as investigations of employee misconduct. Um, you know, and, and whether a search by a government employer violates, again, reasonable expectations of privacy is determined by um, a two-step process. The first thing is whether the action taken by the employer was justified as its inception, so whether they had a reasonable, um, and there's that word again, cause for looking at something. Um, and then whether the search that they conducted or the analysis that they conducted was reasonable in, in the scope related to that reason in the first place. And the, the Quan case talks about a, an employee, I believe he's a police officer, who had a lot of, uh, we're going to date ourselves a little bit, but it was pager, and his pager bill was excessive on a monthly basis. Um, and I think uh, several of them were, so the, their boss went and audited pager usage and his stated reason for doing so was to see if he had to change the contract because he didn't want his police officers having to pay overage on work-related texts. And what he found out is they were this particular individual was abusing um, a lot of personal texts during working hours, uh, messages, excuse me, it's even hard to say, pager messages. Um, and uh, so they disciplined him for that. And there was some back and forth, obviously, and you can read about that in the court or in the court documents. But what the court said was that the, the employer was okay to do that. They had a reasonable reason for going and looking. Um, so that the Constitution does provide uh, protections, some protections, uh, for employees of government entities. It does not come into play um, dealing with private sector employees, and I think that's where most of us work. Um, you, you don't have Fourth Amendment protections there because then the entity that, that's looking at you is not a government entity. Um, the main source of privacy protections in the workplace for private sector employees is common law. Um, and there are, there are a couple of categories that I'm not going to get into that um, common law rights to privacy derive from. The one that we'll talk about a little bit because um, it's the one that's most commonly brought up in workplace cases, is intrusion upon seclusion. Um, and it's uh, basically, it, you know, an employee believes their privacy has been invaded. Um, they can, they can uh, claim an intrusion upon seclusion. To do that, the, the private sector employee has to have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, and 
Beyond that, the intrusion has to be highly offensive to be actionable. And there are court rulings on this. Um, you know, one that was very clear and definitive said that an employer reading your email is not offensive. Um, that's how the courts have ruled on that. So, um, you know, that, that is the source of most protections for private sector employees. Um, and then there are also some statutory protections, um, you know, some laws that have been passed. Um, two states, if you're in Connecticut or Delaware, um, actually have laws that, that regulate um, employee monitoring of employee communications and activities. And what those, what those laws actually state is that the employer must notice or give notification to employees before they do that kind of monitoring. Um, so that's, that's the extent of what those laws say. Um, and that's consistent with the best practices that we always recommend to folks, whether they're in Connecticut or Delaware or not. Um, so th those are the two that are most, uh, most primary known. Uh, nine states have, have laws that prohibit reporting communications without the consent of all parties in the conversation. Um, the courts have consistently shown, though, that two-way consent requirements don't have much impact on workplace internal communications and activities. Um, because, again, there, there's, there has to be that reasonable expectation of privacy, and as long as there was notice, no one can cite that as a reason, um, or as a reason why they thought that they had uh, privacy to begin with. So I've, I've used the word reasonable and reasonable expectations um, several times so far, and I thought, you know, we might, we might stay on that a little bit. And, you know, I should have said this at the beginning of the webinar. I'll say it again at the end. I'm not a lawyer. Um, I'm not giving legal advice here. The, um, you know, what I'm doing is interpreting some of the things that I read. I would always encourage folks to go out and talk to an attorney if they have some real questions about some of this stuff. Um, but if you look at reasonable expectation, you know, the, the law defines reasonable um, as being determined by surrounding circumstances and societies or a reasonable person's views. And I do find that a little bit interesting that they use the same word in the definition. Um, but you know, that you have to be able to pass a sniff test that you actually thought something you're doing was private. Um, and, th and that's the way I understand that. You know, so I have some stats up on the screen. Um, you know, 75% of companies monitor employee Internet usage. 60% um, are going to be monitoring employee social media activity, both professional and personal. I think that's worth noting by 2015. Uh, it's a projection by Gartner, and from the things that I've seen, I believe that's happening. Um, so I think, you know, given stats like that, it would become difficult to make a case that, now I really didn't think that uh, my Internet usage, I thought that was private, becomes a difficult bear, um, a difficult burden to, to, to bear forward. But the other piece on that is that, you know, as we talked about privacy in the workplace, there was always that reasonable expectation and disclosure um, and what that does to an expectation. And in the United States, <clears throat> companies regularly remove the expectation of privacy. Um, you know, if you've been on any of our webinars before, you know, we talk about acceptable use policies and notifying uh, employees if you're going to engage in any kind of monitoring. So let's talk a little bit about disclosure, um, because I think this is central to the kind of whole um, where does privacy in the workplace come down. The, the, legally, you know, we've seen it in some of the states, um, just common sense wise, and then in an element of fairness and, and treating your employees like adults, um, I think all of those things dictate that a company should disclose to their employees if they're going to monitor anything, whether it's you know website usage just for time, or if it's content monitoring, or transactional level monitoring, just levels of activity, um, disclose it. Um, so make it clear that the things going on in the, you know, the digital and online fabric of a company, all the communications and the online activity is going to be monitored. Be specific. Um, you know, specificity is always a good thing, and it's always the more clear you can be with somebody, the more fair you're being to them. And then tell folks why you do it. So, you know, you might have language that's acknowledged at log on or in a document that's signed when somebody joins the company that says the company is going to monitor the content of all email and online communications transmitted by or through the company's electronic resources um, by anybody, right? 
Um, that's pretty broad and pretty specific at the same time. It, it covers everything. Um, you can go further than that and state that we're going to monitor um, activity, whether the communication is for business or non-business purpose. Um, part of the reason for doing that is because you don't necessarily know if somebody's sending an email to a coworker um, or, or an outside company that you do, do business with or to their brother-in-law, it, it's very hard to know that up front. So be, you know, be up front. If you're going to monitor email, tell folks you know, anything you do is, is, is going to be monitored. Um, and then let them know that you know, we don't just do this for fun. There are security reasons. There are investigative activities from time to time. Um, it helps us to support business goals. It can help with maintenance of IT systems, making sure that we're doing things right. And there are times when we may need data to satisfy audits. Um, so you can craft uh, notifications to your employees to kind of walk through what you're doing. Um, that is both, I think, fair to the employee um, and also satisfies legal requirements um, you know, to, to make sure that the things that you're doing, you're complying with the law. Um, and obviously, that is always everyone's goal. So we've talked a lot now, or I've talked a lot, I guess, um, about privacy in general, and I've tried to, tried to dovetail that at least somewhat logically into privacy in the workplace. Um, hopefully, I haven't lost you too many of you with a lot of legal jargon, because I know it can get dry. Uh, I wanted to then you know, talk a little bit about what we do. And it obviously it, it plays into privacy in the workplace, um, because what we do um, can be intrusive, uh, depending on the flavor of the product that you're using. Um, but there are reasons why companies sometimes need to do that. And, and for those of you that have heard me in before, I, I frequently use a phrase where I talk about tilting the balance between uh, privacy and security, and, and when it makes sense to do that, and the ways in which you do that. But I thought I'd step back a little bit and, and kind of share with everybody the reasons why people come to us. Um, so why do people start, whether it's with us or, or, any, or other methods of employee monitoring, why do people do it? And, and let's kind of have a little discussion about that. You know, maybe some of this will resonate with some of you folks out there. So up on the screen um, are the main reasons from our interactions with customers that people utilize our service. And the first two up there, I think, are, are somewhat related. Um, you know, investigations. This is this is what actually brought SpectreSoft into the corporate world. Um, there are times when employers simply need to conduct an investigation of employee activities. Um, it can be done with native tools. Uh, it's a painstaking process. Uh, it takes a lot of hours. There are different forensics tools that require specialized skills um, at times to use them. Um, but it's it's a fact of life that. There are going to be times when an employer has to investigate what someone's doing, and that can be related to a whole host of reasons. Um, but that is, is one of the main use cases we see for our software. Somewhat related to that, um, and you see this, you know, mainly in larger companies, is incident response, um, and and we're used quite widely by companies uh, to help them discover the scope of incidents, to get answers quickly on who or who else was involved in an incident. Um, to identify either flaws in security or in, uh, in policy that could be tightened up so that a similar incident doesn't happen again, and to provide you know, very clear contextual evidence um, if that's necessary, um, whether it's to management, uh, to employees in an education process, um, or you know, frequently to the courts um, you know, in terms of like, things like data breaches. Um, to, to help companies kind of tighten their security. Um, so th those two, I think, are, are somewhat related. We're widely used for productivity purposes. Um, you know, this is kind of the classic examining activity to make sure that, that people are working. And it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's traditionally been the number one uh, use case for our software. There, there is a lot to this. And, and related to that is the efficiency use case that we see. Um, there's, is Bob working, and how is Bob working are kind of the two questions that get answered there. And, and our software gives, pe uh, gives uh, companies the ability to look at individual behavior, group behavior, and company-wide behavior. So you could look at, say, a sales team and be able to say, well, I know who my top performers are. Let me see how they go about their business, what they do throughout the day, how they structure their day, what tools they use. And let me see what I can learn from them that I might be able to apply 
to folks to help them to get better to become a top performer. And there's a lot you can learn from observing somebody's activity. You know, how much time do they spend in the CRM system relative to other folks? How much research online do they do before they place a call? Um, all those things are kind of interwoven into the productivity and efficiency buckets there. And then there are there are simply times when you just need to look at you know who's getting work done. Uh, you know, one of the things that our software is used for it's unpleasant, um, but you want to get it right. And and we have many customers that have used our software to help plan um, for when they need to make changes in their workforce, um, you know, typically a reduction in force. And you want to make sure that you understand um, you know, who your main contributors are, and, and our software can certainly help with that, but also really understand what work is being done and needs to be done and by who. Because um, there are times where you could say, well, I know that person's job is to do X, X may not be getting done or may not really be that necessary, um, or someone else may be doing a lot of X. Um, and our software really can help call those things out. So in a planning process, uh, it, it can really help um, with a more intelligent plan than if you, if you do it sort of off of org chart and, and those types of things. So we've seen that quite, quite often as well. Um, security is the other big driver that we see. Um, and, and there it's all about insider threats, and we, we talk quite a lot about that. But there are just certain things that uh, what I'd call kind of traditional security solutions, security solutions that are premised on um, keeping people out, um, uh, whether it's of areas of a company or um, from the company in general, uh, just cannot see. You know, again, the definition of an insider threat is somebody with proper access using it improperly. So, somebody's been given keys or authorization to use a system, most solutions aren't going to be able to tell you if they're doing something in that solution or in those files that they're not supposed to be doing. Uh, and our software helps quite a bit with that. Um, you know, I, I talk at times about a language of fraud. and there are, there are known keywords and phrases that people use when they're engaged in fraudulent behavior. Um, those Keywords and phrases are going to show up in that online and digital fabric of your company that we talked about earlier. Um, we're, we're very good at detecting them. Um, so that, that's a lot of the security play that we have is around detecting things that are going on. But there's also a deterrence aspect to it. And there's a, there's a parallel that I draw here. I'm going to step out of technology for a minute. Um, if, you, if you've ever been to a casino, there are video cameras everywhere in there, and they're very visible. And they serve. Um, you know, multiple purposes, and they're very similar to the purposes that our software serves uh, inside the company. Um, we talked about detection, you know, video cameras in, in casinos, the eye in the sky are used to detect problems. They're used to keep an eye on the activity on the floor and to help security identify if there's something going on um, and deal with it as it's happening. And our software, we talked about like the language of fraud and being able to detect that, does very similar things. Um, there's a deterrent factor in, in the presence of those cameras. Not only can they help detect problems, but a whole lot of people that might consider trying to cheat are going to look up and say, there's no way I can get away with it. Everything I do is going to be filmed. Someone is watching me. And that's going to alter their behavior before it happens. Um, our software has a deterrent effect um, where people were you know, prone or considering uh, engaging in insider threat-like activities, whether it's uh, data leaking or breaching or the taking of IP or fraud, as I mentioned, um, the presence of our software will deter a lot of that behavior. Now, for it to be an effective deterrent, people need to know it's there. We talked about disclosure earlier. Even in that statement itself, you get some deterrent effect. I always feel like if you're going to make a statement, you need to back it up, and it needs to have some teeth. Um, otherwise, people are going to catch on pretty quick that, um, that it's not there behind you, but that deterrent effect does exist. And then there's a there's a third piece of that that's not mentioned on the slide here, and that's that's detail. And if you think back to the eye in the sky again, um, that's also providing detail of what when, what happens that can be viewed later on to help train, to help improve security, or for evidentiary purposes. And our software does all those same things as well. So that's a big use case for us on security that we see. Um, and then you know the, the last two compliance. Um, we have we have plenty of folks that are using us to help prove that compliance mandates are being met. Um, I, I was on a call this morning where I learned about a company that uh, actually has to prove 
that airline pilots are taking the tests that they're uh, required to take to continue flying. And one of the ways they were looking at possibly doing that is being able to, to record their online activity um, so that they can show that the person was there and doing the work. And I thought that was an interesting one. I hadn't heard that one before. Um, and then finally, just policy um, and being able to ensure company policies are being followed. Um, I, I, I go broken record on this sometime, but I always say you, you need to inspect what you expect. And having a policy is great, but you need to do some spot checking and make sure that people are following those policies. Um, so, you know, we provide the ability to do that. Uh, we also have some benefits. You know, most, if not all, companies are going to have policies on workplace behavior. Um, and there are some legal benefits uh, to making sure that you can enforce those policies or deal with them. You know, we give, we give companies the ability to, to detect inappropriate workplace language, um, you know, harassing type behaviors, and be able to deal with that readily. Um, so we can help enforce policy that way. There's also some legal benefit to companies if they can prove that they've exercised um, you know, due care to, to prevent those types of issues and deal with them in the workplace. That, that can be legally beneficial to the company as well. Um, so those are the reasons why folks come to us. And that may be, you know, some of those may encompass some of the reasons why, uh, why some of you are on the phone here today. So what I thought I'd do now is just sort of transition into a little bit of a discussion about what we do. Um, we, we've used the word monitoring. Uh, we've used the word surveillance earlier. Um, and and that, is, that is what we do. We monitor um, activity on uh, corporate-owned machines on the corporate network. Um, and we collect a lot of information. You know, we talked earlier about all the data that's being collected. We collect a whole lot of data on activity. Um, you know, we install down on endpoints, and we record the activity going on there. And again, it's all the activity in that kind of communications and online fabric. It, it tells the story of how people interact with the resources that they've been given. We take all this information. We write it back to a secure SQL database. Um, in, in the, the main flavor of the flagship product, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a minute, or we can leave that data recording resident on the machine that it occurred. Um, and, and all of that information is collected and can be reported on and alerted on as you decide appropriate. And, and the goal there is to, is to help pull some intelligence for you out of the chatter that's incurring in your company um, and help you to make better decisions as a business, more informed decisions, um, and to tighten up your internal security. Now, Looking at the screen, and you can see all the level of detail that we collect from, uh, from website usage to applications used um, to, to what's going on on somebody's screen, when people log on and log off, email sent and received, what documents they're working in, where they're sending them. Um, all of these things are collected if you want them to be. And you know, one of the key things in our software is that we've architected it to provide customers with options. And what I always tell our our customers and prospective customers to do if they're considering in, in, uh, implementing an employee monitoring program um, is to align it to goals. So to step back and say, what, what are my goals in, in putting this process and this type of software in place? And then make sure that you, you have a product that lets you align to those goals. So as an example, if you're worried about uh, productivity, then you're probably going to want to uh, monitor, among other things, website usage and application usage. And our software uh, can provide very accurate pictures of what's going on there. You know, one of the uniqueness, um, unique features to our software is that we have the ability to differentiate not just between when you're connected to a website or when an application is open on your desktop, but when you're interacting with it. Um, so we, we call that active time. And we use a blend of scrolls and mouse clicks and interactions um, with the hardware to be able to say not that this person had um, Facebook open on their desk for eight hours or that it was in the front window for four hours, and those are the two most common answers you get from other solutions, but to be able to say they interacted with Facebook for seven minutes. Um, so you can get a much truer picture of somebody's activity. The other way I explain it is, um, my software can tell you the difference between somebody going to the Drudge Report and reading the headlines for two minutes before they go off to a two-hour meeting and leave that open on their desktop, or somebody that actually sits there and reads all the articles and wastes two hours of their day in the middle of it reading a bunch of news stories instead of doing their work. We can tell you which happened 
um, with a high degree of accuracy. You know, we can also do that on application usage. Um, you know, so the next time that somebody tells you, oh, I was working on that spreadsheet all day, uh, we can actually let you know whether that happened. Um, so, you know, again, if you're, if you're a productivity-centered uh, uh, or motivated customer, those might be things that you start with. If you're worried about um, inappropriate work, workplace language, you're going to want to monitor communications. And what we provide out of the box is different uh, sets of indicators. Sometimes they're keywords and phrases. Um, sometimes they're actions that uh, people might use or applications that people might install that can help steer you towards finding the answers you're looking for. So we have um, you know, keywords that have no business in the workplace. If you want to monitor for those, we have them built into the product for you. And alerts can spin off and reports can be connected when people start to use that language in their communications. Um, if you're worried about fraud, as I mentioned earlier, we have canned sets of known indicators of fraudulent activity that you can scan for. Um, we, we've built <coughs> into the product lists of um, it, you know, kind of known hacking tools that will sometimes be brought into companies uh, by insiders to try to get access to things that they maybe shouldn't have. Um, you can turn that on and out of the box be looking for them very quickly. Um, you know, we see that a lot actually um, with privileged user monitoring. Um, with monitoring a lot of super users out there that kind of exist outside of the, the normal uh, controls over who can access what data. Uh, we'll see people with an enhanced interest in looking, knowing what tools they're using with the privileges that we've given them. So um, we do collect a lot of data. I'm resisting the urge to say big data. Um, we'll say large data. But, uh, but we do it in a way that gives you as a customer the options over what you want to collect and then also what you want to retain, because that's a, that's a, a big uh, part of the discussion as well. Um, I mentioned earlier that we have some options over where the data is stored. To talk a little bit about that, um, the main products that the company sells in the monitoring space are up here on the screen now. Um, Spectre 360 is the flagship, flagship product. Um, Spectre 360 Recon is our newest product in the portfolio and one that's been getting a lot of positive attention. Um, the differences here are, are really around between 360 and Spectre 360 Recon um, are, are around how the data is retained or not retained um, and what you can do with it. So in Spectre 360, uh, we are collecting all the information we looked at in the previous slide um, based on the settings you say, and we're writing that back to that secure SQL database, and it's available for review, retention, and reporting. Um, we refer to that as active monitoring. So when, when you as a company, you as a, as a uh, user of our software, have a cause to look at someone's activity uh, in some detail, Spectre 360 is the right solution for you. Um, you can see the activity in great detail all the way up to being able to play back screenshots, um, like watching a movie to see exactly what was happening on the screen as if you were sitting in front of the machine looking over their shoulder. Um, and that can be very important for providing context into, into what they did and why they did it. Um, not only in, in, a, in an easy to understand way for you to quickly get the answers that you need, but also if you need to play that back for someone else, it tells a much clearer picture and a much uh, easier to digest picture than trying to piece together security logs and other things that can sort of kind of get you to the same place um, but it's much more difficult to understand. It takes a lot more time to do it. Um, that, that is active monitoring. We see that commonly, as I mentioned, with privileged users. Um, we see it, uh, we see people using those in investigative use cases. Uh, we see it for incident response purposes quite often. Um, we see it in areas where there are known to be issues. Um, so uh, I talked about fraud earlier. There are departments within companies where the vast majority of fraudulent activity occurs. We have many customers that actively monitor those departments because um, they're concerned about fraud and the impacts they could have. And then a lot of those customers are employing our passive monitoring solution, the new solution, Spectre 360 Recon, um, more broadly. What Recon does is everything from that previous slide that Spectre 360 can record, Recon can record. Um, but rather than writing the data back to a secure central database, we're leaving that data um, in an obfuscated file on the machine where the activity took place. We're effectively logging the activity 
and then we can spin alerts off of that based on what you're looking for clues on activity in your environment. So uh, again, inappropriate workplace behavior, we could spin off an alert and let you know that's happening on that machine by that user. Um, fraudulent language, uh, indicators of IP theft, those types of things we can alert on and then you as a company can make a decision to whether we need to look deeper, do we need to switch from this passive recon mode to a detailed 360 mode to really get a clear picture of what's going on in the workplace. And then the other product listed up here on the slide, Spectre CNE, um, is uh, capable of recording all the same activity. This is a, a much simpler version of the product. It's great for, for smaller businesses. It doesn't carry a full SQL back end. It's a little bit easier to install and get up and running. Um, doesn't give you all the same benefits of 360 with aggregation um, and reporting of data. Uh, it's also great for kind of temporary focused investigations. If, if, um, if your hair is on fire and you need a fire extinguisher, CNE is your tool. If, uh, if somebody were to walk into your office and say, hey, we've got to get a look at what's going on on Joe's computer. What can we do? We need to put eyes on Joe's activities right now. We think we have a problem. Um, if you don't have something in place already, I would tell you to start with Spectre CNA. You'd be up and running in less than 15 minutes and being able to see some of that activity. Um, so those are the, the two main products, or the three main products in our portfolio. We talked uh, quite a bit about Spectre 360, um, and this you know, gives you a, a little bit more color on what Spectre 360 does. Um, it gives you that unparalleled visibility into what's happening in your company. It lets you see things in context um, that other solutions simply can't provide to you. And again, it's focused on human activity. Um, so that lets us see things, again, that, that um, might otherwise be missed. Down along the bottom of the slide, you'll see um, we're making our data available um, into places where people have asked for it. Um, so we, we currently have connectors into into two great partner companies, uh, ArcSight and Splunk. Um, and a lot of customers have asked us to make our activity data and our alerting available in their SIM solutions because that's where they're consuming that type of data. So those connections are available for you. Um, and I would encourage anyone that has interest in those or is using those to take a look at that um, and, to, and to talk to your sales representative about those. Um, Spectre 360 Recon, uh, I, I've talked a little bit about that. Um, that is our newest solution. We can flow the data into the same solutions I just talked about. I mentioned earlier in the webinar that uh, it's been getting a lot of positive attention um, for this new approach, this passive monitoring approach that is unique in the market. No one else is doing anything quite like this. It really gives employers um, a lot of benefits in being able to balance that, that employee privacy and security um, as appropriate on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and uh, we're pretty proud of this solution, and you can see that we're getting a lot of uh, positive attention. Um, we were very excited to win Best of Interop Security uh, months ago, and then uh, very recently uh, we won the SC Magazine Europe Award for the Best Fraud Prevention Solution. We talked a little bit about fraud there. But I thought I'd, I'd close here before we get to the questions by sharing um, some of what the, the industry press um, is saying about us, and you know, this was uh, Tim Wilson, who was the executive editor of Dark Reading. It's a fantastic site if you don't read it. Um, in talking about Spectre 360, he was one of the judges for the uh, Best Interop Award. Um, I said, while the judges reviewed many great new products for this year's security awards, Spectre 360 Recon seemed particularly groundbreaking in that it solves a critical high-profile security problem, tracking user activity to prevent data leaks while also solving a sensitive, problematic IT problem, protecting user privacy in the enterprise. The resolution of both these problems in an affordable, safe manner makes Spectre 360 Recon a two-pronged two groundbreaker and the clear winner in this year's security category competition. I can't come up with better words to describe Recon than, uh, than Tim did. Uh, we appreciate his kind words, but I would really encourage you guys, if you haven't taken a look at it, uh, to take a look at the Recon solution. Uh, there's a reason why it's getting, uh, getting so much attention and winning so many awards. So that um, is about all the A material I have. That was what I had hoped to cover off with you guys today. Um, <coughs> 
So I think at that point we can uh, we can open up for questions if there are any and uh, see where we go. Hey Mike, there are uh, a bunch of questions here. I think we'll uh, only have time for a couple of them though. Um, but um, anybody who's we don't get to will definitely um, answer um, offline. Um, so the first question here is. Um, uh, what is the risk of false positives with the mo with our monitoring solutions? Yeah, that's a um, that's a really good question. Um, so you know, kind of a two pronged answer to that. Um, the first is I mentioned earlier that we have these out of the box uh, groups of indicators that you can monitor for, and I think you need to be intelligent in your targeting with those indicators um, to ensure that you're watching for what you really intended to watch for. And I'll, and I'll use an example that probably everybody internally here at Spectrosoft is tired of me using, but um, you know, one of the phrases um, that is a, a known indicator of fraudulent activity is it's a gray area. Um, so if you're seeing phrases around it's a gray area, it's gray um, in your communication, that can be an indicator of fraudulent activity depending on who's using it. Uh, if you have people in accounting using that phrase, um, that is of a higher concern to you than somebody that perhaps is not in accounting. Um, I married an accountant. I learned very early on that there are very few, if any, gray areas in accounting. Um, you know, phrases like that used by accountants, hold the quarter open, book it in another period. Um, those can be indicators. You would not want to deploy those broadly against the company. You'd want to target them to where they're meaningful. So that, that's a way to, to cut down on false positives uh, in the solution. But the other piece to that is our, our solution is used a lot to help reduce false positives that might exist in other places. Um, because we provide you that full contextual view. Uh, we had a customer that brought to us a case once that we've mentioned in the past where they had a sales rep downloading customer lists, attaching them to an email, and sending them to an unknown Gmail account. And it was detected with our software because the, it started with the rep was downloading an abnormal number of files relative to what normally happens with salespeople. Um, and, uh, so they started to drill a little bit deeper, and they became very concerned about this rep's behavior. It happened to be a top performing rep, so they were doubly concerned. Um, and it looked like customer lists were going out the door, and they didn't know why. They were able to go back in time um, and play back activity. And what they learned was that rep um, had received an email from her boss, who was off-site at a meeting and needed those files, but his machine was hosed. Uh, he couldn't get them off his machine. He was on somebody else's machine. It was his Gmail account. Um, so there, there was no crisis there. Um, a DLP solution may have, de may have detected those files going out the door, and it certainly would have looked damning. The ability to go in very quickly and see the context that that activity took place in you know, is, is, a, is a way that we help cut down on false positives. So hopefully that answers the question. So then the next question here is um, just knowing that they are being monitored, uh, in what way does that have a deterrent effect on people's behavior? Yeah, um, good question. And, uh, and, you know, I think we touched on it a little bit earlier today. Um, but, you know, I, I think the deterrent effect um, or the, the behavior modification effect, there are two pieces uh, to that within our software. One is its presence. Um, if there's, a, there's some great research by a group called the Sentencing Project. They're, they're not working in, in internal security for, for corporations. They're looking at, at uh, the criminal justice system. But they did some great research that shows that the certainty of punishment, so the likelihood of getting caught and punished, has a greater um, deterrent effect on the commission of crimes than the severity of punishment. Or the way I translate it is, the more likely I am to think I'm going to get caught the less likely I am to do it. Um, and, and I think the presence of our software, or software like it, um, has that deterrent effect on it. There are other things that we can do within the software. We didn't talk about it earlier. Um, we have the ability to uh, pop um, 
messages down to the user's desktop. So uh, a first level of deterrence or behavior modification, well, let's use an example of inappropriate language in the workplace. If you have um, you know, rules about uh, you know, not, not using any words that George Carlin would have used in his stand-up act, um, you can monitor for those, and if somebody's including that in an email, they can actually get a pop-up on their desktop that says, hey, you just bought the company's acceptable use policy, you use this word in your communication, and that's a pretty powerful way of making sure that's not going to happen again. Um, so those, those are kind of the, the, the two deterrent pieces um, that I think are inherent in the software. So th this, this question kind of, kind of is a lead off of that one, but what about behavioral controls or processes that can be put into place to augment monitoring? Uh, that's a really good question. So, um, and I think I saw another one in the list here too, is, is there any way to monitor the investigators? And I think these questions are related, maybe even from the same person. So um, in some of our other webinars and in some of the, the, uh, the white papers that we have out, we talk a lot about um, using our software in conjunction with process and policy. Um, there are absolutely processes that companies need to put in place and policies they need to put in place to use the software effectively. Um, so start with who should receive alerts and who should receive act, uh, review activity. You, for the most part, uh, folks in IT did not sign up to be judge and jury over their peers. Um, you know, I, IT is certainly an enabler of technology like ours and getting it installed and set up properly. but. Think about some of the use cases I've talked about today. If we're talking about fraudulent activity, the, the people in the, in the right uh, position to be able to determine if something serious is going on um, related to fraud reside in your CFO's office, um, if you're big enough to have one, um, in finance, or with the owner of your company. Um, so I would, I would send alerts of that nature to those folks. Um, if we're talking about inappropriate language or harassing type behavior, HR is the right place to go with that type of information. So you want to kind of configure the software and put a process in place so that the right people are receiving the alerts um, to make the right decisions on whether it's necessary to look deeper into activity. So that would kind of be the first step. The next step is to put some process around unlocking or looking deeper into activity. Um, depending on your company's culture and, and local laws, you may want to reside that with very few people in your company. So our software is able to, to be configured um, so that you can assign you know, down to one person that would have the ability to say uh, convert a recon style recording where the data is not available, it's, it's housed on that local machine, to a detail style recording where it is available. Maybe only one person in the company can do that. Now, if that person exercises that ability and converts monitoring from recon to detail, an alert can be spun off, then that could go to, say, the owner of the company or the head of HR or your general counsel. Um, because they, according to your company process, might be the ones that say it's okay to look at that data. So if they receive that alert but didn't give permission, they can put a stop to it immediately. If they did give permission, then they know the work they asked to be done is getting done. Um, so there's a couple of pieces in there. And then we also have admin auditing built into the software. So that lets, that lets someone go in and effectively watch the watchers and see what the users of the software are doing. So you can see, well, if, if we've decided to deploy this on 25 people in the organization, did someone go and deploy it on another 10? Who did it? When did they do it? Um, you can certainly set off alerts to help present that and assign roles within the the software on who can do it as well. Um, but we built in admin auditing and then alerting um, on, on some of the more uh, bigger decision points within the software usage. So hopefully that addresses those questions. Thanks, Mike. I think we're just about out of time here. So um, we'll wrap it up by uh, announcing the contest winner and then uh, sign off. Yeah, and I, I just saw it. So give me a minute. I got to. Uh i got to scroll through it, and actually, do you see the contest winner, Ezra, because I just lost him? I do. It's uh, Jacob B. I won't announce your last name, but you'll uh, receive an email from me. I'm Ezra at Spectrosoft, and uh, I'll, I'll uh, reach out to you and just ask you for that shipping information, and we'll get your GoPro right out to you so we can uh, get more people on film here. <laughs> well said. Well said. Congratulations, Jacob. 
Um, you know, his GoPros are very cool. So, so everybody, thank you for your time. If we didn't get to your question uh, live here, we will get answers out to you. We have them all here in the uh, in the go to meeting session. Uh, I apologize if we didn't get to you, uh, but we'll work on those. Uh, thanks everybody for your time, and I hope you have a great rest of the day. All right. Uh, Ryan with Spiceworks just hopping back in. Just want to uh, tell all our attendees thank you. And, of course, uh, a special thanks to all the folks at Spectrosoft who made this happen. And you're going to get a link to this recording in about a week. I know a lot of people were asking about that. Uh, so just be on the lookout for that, and, and you'll have that asset so you can watch it uh, whenever you want and present it to your peers. Uh, but, again, thank you so much. A really involved Q&A, which we love to see. Um, so I hope that everyone has a great afternoon.